We are in a series, right in the middle of a series, actually coming to the end of a series called When I Met Jesus, looking at some of the encounters people had in the Scriptures, in, in the Gospels with Jesus. <clears throat> Not just people, sometimes elements like you know, wind and waves. Uh, we've looked at pre-incarnate Jesus in the fire with Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego. Uh, I've been looking at how Jesus interacts with people who are very lowly in a socioeconomic sense and people who are very haughty in a socioeconomic sense. <clears throat> Today, we kind of have both of those in the one, in the one story. So I'm going to read for you John 9, and we're going to pray and get stuck into it. This is when the blind man met Jesus. As he was passing by, as Jesus, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, that means teacher, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Neither this man nor his parents sinned, Jesus answered. This came about so that God's work, works might be displayed in him. We must do the works of him who sent me while it's day. Night is coming when no one can work. As long as, as, long as I'm in the world, I am the light of the world. After he said these things, he spit on the ground, made some mud from the saliva, spread the mud on his eyes. Go, he said, wash in the pool of Siloam, which means sent. So he left, washed, and came back seeing. Miracle. Absolute miracle. That's, that's my edit, editorial. That's not in the scripture. Uh, his neighbours and those who had seen him before as a beggar said, isn't this the one who used to sit begging? Some said he's the one. Others were saying no, but he looks like him. They're thinking it can't be him. <clears throat> he kept saying, I'm the one. So they asked him, then how are your eyes opened? He answered, the man called Jesus made mud, spread it on my eyes and told me, go to Siloam and wash. So when I washed, uh, went and washed, I received my sight. Where is he? They asked. I don't know, he said. They brought the man who used to be blind to the Pharisees. It's amazing how even the title of the guy changes. Uh, he meets Jesus, amazing. He was the blind man. Now he's the man who used to be blind. The day that Jesus made the mud and opened his eyes was a Sabbath. Then the Pharisees asked him how again he received his sight. He put mud on my eyes. This is the like, third time he's told the story. He put mud on my eyes, he told them. I washed and I can see. Some of the Pharisees said, this man is not from God because he doesn't keep the Sabbath. But others were saying, how could a sinful man perform such signs? And there was a division among them. Again, they asked a blind man, what do you say about him since you opened your eyes? He's a prophet, he said. The Jews did not believe this about him, that he was blind and received sight, until they summoned the parents of the one who had received his sight. They asked them, is this your son, the one you say was born blind? Then how does he see? We know this is our son and that he was born blind, his parents answered, but we don't know how he now sees and we don't know who opened his eyes. Ask him, he's of age. He'll speak for himself. His parents said these things because they were afraid of the Jews since the Jews had already agreed that if anyone confessed him, that's Jesus, as the Messiah, the one sent from God, God's anointed one, he would be banned from the synagogue. This is why his parents said, he's evade, just him. They were afraid. So a second time they summoned the man who'd been born blind and told him, give glory to God. We know that this man is a sinner. He answered, whether or not he's a sinner, I don't know. One thing I do know, I was blind, now I can see. Then they asked him, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? The guy's getting frustrated. I already told you, he said, and you don't listen. Why do you want to hear it again? You don't want to become his disciples too, do you? They ridiculed him. You're that man's disciple, but we're Moses' disciples. We know that God has spoken to Moses, but this man, we don't know where he's from. This is an amazing thing, the man told them. You don't know where he's from and yet he opened my eyes. We know that God doesn't listen to sinners. But if anyone is God-fearing and does his will, he listens to him. Throughout history, no one has ever heard of someone opening the eyes of a person born blind. If this man were not from God, he wouldn't be able to do anything. You were born entirely in sin, they replied. And you are trying to teach us. Then they threw him out. Jesus heard that the man had been thrown out. When he found him, he asked, do you believe in the Son of Man? Who is he, sir, that I might believe in him? 
he asked. Jesus answered, you have seen him. In fact, he is the one speaking with you. I believe, Lord, he said, and he worshipped him. Jesus said, I came into the world for judgment in order that those who do not see will see and those who do see will become blind. Some of the Pharisees who were with him heard these things and asked him, we aren't blind too, are we? If you were blind, Jesus told them, you wouldn't have sin. But now that you say we see, your sin remains. Okay, chunky passage, robust encounter with Jesus. Let's pray and ask God to help us. And again, Father, we ask you to help us. As we've opened your scriptures, we, we want eyes to see, ears to hear, soft hearts and minds and spirits to your Holy Spirit as you speak to us. Through your scriptures, through me today, please help us to see you as you really are, to hear your voice in these words that we would become more like Jesus, understand more of your character, your goodness, your kindness, your majesty and your justice. We pray this in Jesus' holy name. Amen. So the blind man, at the beginning of the story, he's blind. Disciples see him and they want to know whose sin has caused this man's blindness. Who's sin? Something bad has happened. It's been a very long time since the guy's birth. So why? Why is it bad? Why do bad things happen? It's basically what they're saying. And why has it happened to this guy? This would have been a pretty common question at the time. And man, I think it's a question we still hear in various forms today. Why God? Or why me? Why is this happening to me? Or if you see someone else who's going through a difficult time or like this man from from birth, say, why, what has he or she done to deserve this? Or have you ever asked that question for yourself? What did I do to deserve this? What did I do? Such a punishment. I must have done something terrible to deserve these present circumstances, this sickness, this relationship breakdown, this vocational mishap, this whatever it is. What did I do? It's all a variation on the theme of, of karma. That there are cosmic scales. <clears throat> and somehow if we do bad things, bad things will come for us. If we do good things, then good things will come for us. It's strong echoes in this, you get what you deserve. Strong echoes of the prosperity gospel in there as well. well if I do all the right things, the God owes me. He must give me health. He must give me Prosperity must give me a good life, must give me easy, pleasant, comfortable circumstances. All the lights should turn green just as I arrive at those lights. It is a, it's an insidious form of relating to God and it, it weaves or roots its way into our worldview if we're not very careful against it. And these disciples are going, okay, we have this karmic understanding of the world to a degree. You look at the Proverbs and the Proverbs are full of things that say, if you do good things, you will get good results. So we call that conventional wisdom because all other things being equal, on the balance of things, those things are true. If you waste all your money, you're going to have no money. But then sometimes people waste all their money and then they still have money. Or good people will prosper and evil people won't prosper. And then all of a sudden you're like, but this evil person's doing awesome. And these good people, myself included, obviously, (laughs) we're struggling or things just don't seem to go, you can't catch a break. What did I do to deserve this? And then you read Ecclesiastes and Lamentations and you go, oh, okay. Good things happen to super evil people. Terrible things happen to really lovely, wonderful people. But the understanding of these disciples is everything is a result of particular sin. This guy was born blind. So either he's done something very bad, 
Well, because he was born blind, perhaps it was his parents, because how could he have sinned before birth? And so they're just trying to decide, how, how do we understand these things? How would he understand suffering like this? We understand suffering, the, the root cause of suffering is sin. But it's not necessarily my individual sin that causes my bad circumstances or suffering. Uh, I shared recently about my dad who got hit by a bus, not a figurative bus, a literal bus. And, you know, very bad things happened to him, nearly died. Will, will die sooner than he would have otherwise. Uh, he was doing everything right, so far as he could, but someone else's sin. And we could track that back and track that back and keep tracking that back and ultimately to Adam's sin. And so yes, sin is. Sin is the cause. And these people are trying to find out, what about my, what's my specific sin? So that I don't do that sin and have kids who are born blind. That's basically... So that's what they're trying to find out. They're looking for the checklist. Where's my checklist? How can I do all the things on this side of the equation so that I get what I want on that side of the equation? Again, it's basically a version of the prosperity gospel. God loves me because I'm good. If bad things happen, I must have done something to displease him. That's not how God relates to us. God doesn't relate to us he does not have karmic scales. But you can hear this creeping into your worldview if you say things like, uh, "What? I hope to get into heaven, like if, if they let me, if I just scrape in. As if like I climbed the moral ladder or the, the kind of, I've, I've, I've checked off enough checkboxes just to get over. But really, again, you're just saying it's my righteousness and God owes me because of my righteousness. And because I know my righteousness is not amazing, it's just adequate by our own understanding. God owes me adequate. I just sneak in. It's not how it works. It's not how God relates to his people. God does discipline his people. So bad things happen because of other people's sin. Things that are uncomfortable to us can happen because God disciplines his children and that feels uncomfortable when he disciplined. I don't, I don't know how you were disciplined as a child, whether by you know, a wooden spoon or a, a, a glove or by being sent to your room or you know, privation of something or whatever it was. I'm not, try, I'm not trying to comment on you know, the efficacy or the, the, the ethics of any of those kinds of things, only to say, like the scripture says, all discipline is uncomfortable. You don't enjoy it. But God's discipline produces in us holiness and Christ-likeness. He is working out all things for our good. The suffering, the uncomfortable things, whether they come because of his uh, rebuke and correction, or they come because somebody else has been foolish or evil or negligent, it doesn't come as punishment. God is just. And so if Jesus has taken the punishment of your sin, and he has, God will not and cannot punish you for that same sin. He won't punish you for something he's, Jesus has already taken the punishment for. Your sin, past, present, and future is dealt with. This is the good news of the gospel. There are no karmic scales. And if there are, we can't balance them in our favour. But Jesus has. Paid for every sin. Not bringing us from deficit to neutral. Bringing us from deficit to perfection. As if we had lived his life. And so if the Father looks at you, he doesn't, he doesn't punish you. He will correct you if you are one of his. Because good fathers discipline their children. Scripture tells us. And God being the best, perfect Father will discipline all of us, correct us, save us from ourselves and our own ways and bring us into conformity with Jesus. But He won't punish you. The punishment's been dealt with. His discipline comes from His love, 
not from karmic justice. So again, when you suffer, God's not punishing you. He's not far from you. In fact, it's the opposite. Scripture promises us in the midst of our suffering, he is one who is closer than a brother. He is not just intimate with us and for, by, by knowing us intimately. He is imminent. He's here always. So he hasn't abandoned you. He's not punishing you. He hasn't failed you in your suffering. He's with you in your suffering. <clears throat> so Jesus tells his disciples, okay, who's sin? Neither this man nor his parents sinned. And by that, he doesn't mean that they're sinless. He means that it wasn't the sin of the kid, who's now a man. It wasn't the sin of the parents that has caused this blindness. He's saying you're understanding sin and punishment wrong. And the Pharisees have come in and they have the same incorrect understanding. The parents don't have the right understanding. The crowd doesn't have the right understanding. So Jesus is coming and he's helping people understand how does it actually work. He says, This came about so that God's works might be displayed in him. We must do the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. As long as I'm in the world, I am the light of the world. This would have been one of those like head-scratching, mind-blowing moments for the disciples where they go, what? what does that mean? I am the light of the world? Jesus is saying what Paul will later echo. So God prepares good works in advance for us to walk in. And what Jesus is identifying in this man is not how can we attribute blame for what this guy's done, but he's saying how has the Father brought me into the path of this man to display his work in the world? So what he says, we must do the works of him who sent me. It says daytime now. Daytime's when you do work. Daytime's when it's light. You can see what you're doing. You can see your hands. Daytime's for working. He says, night's coming. That's, we're not going to work in the night. We're going to work in the day. He says, as long as I'm in the world, it's daytime because I'm the light. He's saying, I've got work to do. That's why we're here. That's why we've encountered the blind man. We're about to see the breaking in of the kingdom and the king of the kingdom. His, light, his, his job is to shine into the darkness. That's his work. And it's the same work that he gives to his disciples, same work that he gives to all of us because he says in Matthew 6, you are the light of the world. He says, as long as I'm in the world, I'm the light of the world. He says, you are the light of the world. Not that you are divine like him, but that you are in the world to, again, shine into the darkness, to join him in stepping into, walking in those good works that God has prepared in advance for you to walk in, to identify, not to try to go, well, I can't help this person because of some karmic scales and you know, they deserve it, but rather to say, how can I participate in the breaking into the kingdom in this moment? How do I put on display the works of God? That's what it means to be about the business of God. That's what it means to be the light of the world. And just says, City 70 Hill can't be hidden. People don't put a light under a bowl, but they put it on a stand so that it gives light to all in the house. It says, in the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good deeds and give glory to your Father in heaven. So we are also light bringers. We are also about the Father's work in the world. It's what verse 3 calls God's works displayed. This is our light. God's works on display. The character, the nature of God reflected in his people like a prophetic banner to the world. It's again what Jesus talks about in John 13, 34, 35. It says, this is my commandment. You love one another in the same way that I've loved you, you must love one another. And by that love, all people will know that you belong to me if you love one another. It's putting on display the work of God in the world. After these things, he spit on the ground. Can you imagine? Here's Jesus, blind man, <clears throat> interacting with the blind man. I mean, talking about the blind man in front of him with his disciples, that's 
I mean, it's quite a scene, right? And then he spits on the ground. And then he doesn't just spit, he gets down into the dirt and he kind of, he works it. The disciples are already scratching their heads thinking, what? And now also what? And he picks up that money, puts it in the guy's eyes and they're thinking, we're going to get arrested. I don't know what they were thinking. But he tells the man, go, wash in the pool of Siloam, which means sent. Go, I'm sending you. And he does it and he's healed. He comes back seeing. It's a, really weird, it's a really weird way to do it. We've seen in other times, in other encounters with Jesus, where he just speaks. He says, get up. Get up, little girl. And she, she comes back from the dead. Or he says to oppressive spirits, get out. And they have to. Because of his authority, his, his sovereignty, his rule and reign. He's in the middle of a storm. The, the experienced fishermen around him, they're like, we're dead. We're dead. And Jesus says, quiet you, wind, calm down, waves. And they do. They have to obey his voice because he's the creator of those things. But here we come to the blind man and Jesus makes mud with his spit. It's, uh, I don't understand it, but it's also why the people just don't believe it. Firstly, they don't believe it because he's born, he was born blind. It's not like he had sight and then lost it in some accident or, or sickness and then he got better. Where people go, oh, okay, well, sure. Someone said that you were going to get better. It's just a coincidence. This guy was born blind. He'd never seen everybody. He was a beggar. He couldn't do anything. He was contributing, from, from what we can tell, very little to society other than need. <clears throat> And when people ask him, how can you see? Doctor, this can't be the guy. This can't be the guy. But it is the guy. What happened? He said, oh, this dude made mud with a spit, put it in my eyes, now I see. People are, again, it's incredulous, right? It's incredible. People going, that doesn't make sense. That doesn't happen. What are you talking about? Even, I mean, even they already had a rule in the synagogue. You can't acknowledge Jesus as Messiah. We'll boot you out. We see that because the parents are afraid of this happening to them. So obviously people know that, about Jesus. They know what's been going on. They know he's speaking to winds and, winds and waves and evil spirits and dead people and all of them obey him. And now they're like, he is making mud. And so he tells the story over and over and over again. It's like, I don't believe it. It's impossible. And why? Mud. Eventually the Pharisees hear about it. They ask the formerly blind man to give an account and he tells them the same story. This is what the Pharisees say. Some of the Pharisees said, this man's not from God. They're frustrated. They're like, we've already got the rule. This can't be the guy. This is not the dude we're waiting for. If he was the Messiah, he would come to us. He would know who we are. He'd come to us and through us. He'd make us feel good because we're the ones with the checklist. He can't be the guy. And he doesn't keep the Sabbath. God said, don't do work on the Sabbath. He did work. He tilled the ground. I wonder if this is why Jesus did this with mud and not just with his voice. So he could show again his sovereignty, his lordship over the Sabbath. He's not subject to the Sabbath. He is a lord over the Sabbath, the day of rest. But he does work on the day of rest. He does it a lot, actually. I mean, there's other times when you know, he tells a man to stretch out his hand and the man's healed. So even then, the scribes and the teachers of the law aren't satisfied. They say, others were saying, how can a sinful man perform science? They don't believe him. They don't believe Jesus. They don't believe the blind man. They don't believe what's going on. They're like, how is this possible? So they bring in the parents to try to discredit the man. They say, parents, like, what's really going on here? And they're afraid of the Pharisees. And so they're like, don't ask us, man. All we can tell you is definitely born blind. And he definitely sees now. And the only intervening thing that we can see was he met Jesus. So a second time they bring the man back in. They say, come on, guy. Give glory to God. We know Jesus is a sinner. Give glory to God instead. And he answers, man, this is what he says. Whether or not he's a sinner, I don't know. One thing I know, he says, I don't know the guy. I've never, I've never seen him. 
Literally never seen him. One thing I do know, I was blind, but now I can see. Then they asked him, what did he do to you? How did he open his eyes? I already told you, you don't listen. Do you want to to become his disciples too? They ridiculed him. You're the man's disciple. We've got Moses. We don't know where this guy's even from. He says, isn't that amazing? You don't know where he's from. Only God can do these things. He must be from God. You missed him, is the implication. And they booed him. Like, you can't be here anymore. They can't receive the word. They can't receive the good news. They don't have ears to hear. They don't have eyes to see. They are tethered to their checklist. And they can't do it. And even just the sight of this guy challenges the core of their beliefs. And he's exposed it to them as well. They say, you were born entirely in sin. Again, with this misunderstanding. Must have been your parents' sin. Must have been your sin. You must be a sinful person. Otherwise, why would God punish you like this? Why would your life be so bad? You must have been a super bad sinner. And they claim Moses. Here's a really cool part. Man, I love this bit. Jesus heard that they'd thrown the man out. And when he found them, he asked, do you believe in the Son of Man? Who is he, sir, that I might believe in him? He asked. This word believe here. We've already seen him acknowledge Jesus before the Pharisees. Like he believes that Jesus is from God. He believes that Jesus has the power over his sight. <clears throat> he's probably listening, back, like thinking back to stories he's heard about Jesus because what else is he going to do? He's not doing work. He's just sitting on the street listening all day. Probably heard about Jesus, about all these other wonderful things and now he's encountered Jesus. He's experienced Jesus' power and sovereignty. And so he, he already believes in Jesus. There's some sort of belief, but then he says, I want to believe in him. So we get so we get our word faith from. And one of the growing <clears throat> um, one of the growing thoughts about this word belief is that it includes a sense of allegiance. So it's not just I believe I believe, like I I acknowledge that he has done this thing. We know that. It's indisputable that he's done it. He's received healing. He sees and he's never seen before, a grown man. So what he says, believe here. There's, it's more than just acknowledging that Jesus is who he says he is. He wants to pledge his allegiance to him. He wants to put his trust in him. He wants to say, I have faith in you. Jesus answers, you've seen him. In fact, he's the one speaking with you. He pulls out Obi-Wan Kenobi. Of course I know him. He's me. He says, I'm him. I'm the one. I, I healed you before. I've come and found you now. I'm him. And he says, I believe, Lord. Again, word, this word believe, I trust. You have my allegiance. And he calls him Lord. And then it says, and he worshipped him. James, one of Jesus' brothers, he writes in his letter, this is my paraphrase, he says, oh, you believe in God? Good on you. Even, even the demons believe in God and they tremble. So we're talking about we believe in Jesus. We're not just talking about, oh, I believe that he exists. We're not just talking about, <clears throat> oh, yeah, I believe that he created the world. We're not even just saying, oh, I believe that he died on the cross, rose again and he's paid for my sin. It's not an intellectual assent to a a, a set of beliefs. It is coming under his lordship. It's worshipping him as king, submitting our lives to him, pledging our allegiance to him. We say, I live for you. That's what it means. I live for you. He is our saviour and he's our Lord. We can't just acknowledge who he is and what he's done. We put our trust in him and come under his rule and reign. And then even Jesus talks about, then we go and participate in his rule and reign. It's wonderful. The formerly blind man 
comes to Jesus and pledges allegiance to a new king, a new Lord. And then Jesus replies, I came into this world for judgment in order that those who do not see will see and those who do see will become blind. And some of the Pharisees, they're saying, whoa, you're calling us blind? We got Moses, man. We got our checklist. We're doing awesome. You're calling us blind? And Jesus says, yep. This is why he's encountered the blind man. So the glory of God could be put on display. Again, the breaking in of of Jesus' kingdom, showing him to be sovereign over everything, but also to show that those who are proclaiming sight, proclaiming their heritage, we got Moses, we got the law, we got the prophets, we have prestige, we have standing, we are the teachers of the law, or we are the Pharisees, we're the ones who are, we're like the A plus people of God. You guys are like down here, we're doing everything, we're checking all the boxes. And Jesus says, no, the, the blind guy sees, but you don't. He's, show, he's, putting, he's showing through something material what's actually happening in the spiritual. He says, you thought this man was blind? He said, I've brought the material into line with the spiritual and I'm telling you what's happening in the spiritual with your own life. You are the blind ones, he says. You miss me. Even while Jesus, even while Moses and the prophets all point to Jesus, it says, you miss me. What does this mean for us? Well, firstly, don't miss Jesus. Don't miss him. Seeing with your eyes, but blind to the reality of who God is. We might be even wise in our own eyes. We might be very knowledgeable about many things. I think we've got things sorted out or figured out. And Jesus says, you can see many things in the natural, but if you don't see him with spiritual eyes, you're blind. He says, consider the blind man. He was an uneducated beggar and he is schooling the most learned people. How does he do this? It's because he sees, but they don't. Before he would have to be led by the hand places. And now he is the one, the one who sees, who is showing the blind the reality of the situation. It's not an intelligence test. Faith in Jesus. It's not about who has the degree or the pedigree. It's not about who has the biggest treasury, just to make a rhyme. The Pharisees are trusting in these kinds of things. We know more stuff. We've got Moses. We sit in the positions of power. We we are confident in what we're doing. We see, but they didn't see. It's not about figuring it out. It's about seeing Jesus for who he is. And when you see him, it's about trusting in him. It's about submitting to his rule and reign. Here's the progression of the blind man, talking about Jesus. <clears throat> so first he says, there was a man. So Jesus was a man, that's what he can identify. And then he says uh, to the Pharisees, oh, he is a prophet. And then you hear him say, second time around, uh, he is God's sent one. So man, prophet, the one sent from God. And then finally, he says to Jesus, you're my king. And he worships him. There's this progression of, of knowledge. But even when he sees that Jesus is the one sent by God, uh, he, he sees, which leads him to worship, which leads him to coming under his rule and reign and then joining him in his rule and reign. My question is, have you stopped somewhere along that progression? Uh, most people in the world who have heard about Jesus understand that Jesus was a man who lived. So, you know, most people, no serious academic or historian denies that Jesus existed. So that's a, that's a gimme. Jesus is a, was a man. Most people in the world acknowledge that Jesus was a prophet. The majority of people who live in the world look at Jesus and at least see him, or view him 
as a prophet. Many people in the world, possibly into their billions, believe that Jesus was the one sent by God or God who has come and to live among us. It's one of the things that we celebrate at Christmas. God among us, he's, the Word became flesh. God sent one. And the real question then is, or even some acknowledge him as a saviour. So yeah, Jesus, he's done the work. He's, he's, he's saved us. Uh, but have we stopped before we actually come under his lordship? We say, thank you, Jesus, for your salvation. Like we've talked about before, like Christian streakers only wearing the helmet of salvation, nothing else. Uh, or are you actually under his lordship? Have you actually, like this guy does, said, I, I belong to you. I'm yours. You're, you're God. I'm worshipping you. I come under your rule and reign. It's funny how um, in recent months, so when I was at uni the first time, back in the 90s, like 25 years ago, uh, kind of the, the, the dominant uh, academic worldview, at least, was there's no God. No God. God does not exist. Uh, everything can be, can be explained through naturalistic material means. Uh, in, I mean, this year at least, it seems to be that, um, like I speak to many academics and uh, most of them believe in some sort of creative personal force. Spoke to a uh, head of um, astrophysics at Harvard, he said, yeah, absolutely. The word is too, not, not a Christian, the word is too structured. Uh, I spoke to another, another, you know, multiple, multiple doctors. He's like, yeah, of course. I don't believe in this personal God that you guys all, you know, you Christians believe in. But absolutely, uh, there is some creative, I like get personal creative force. It doesn't want anything to do with me, but he set everything up. Or, or, or they, actually, it seems to be a, a popular thing. Uh, many, many, many more people kind of swinging back towards, oh, there's probably, on the preponderance of the evidence, something out there. Uh, but again, I see those echoes of James saying, yeah, even the, even the demons acknowledge God, but they remain his enemies. They shudder. Because they've seen him, but they have not put their hope and their trust and their allegiance in him. Have you stopped somewhere along that line? And do you need to have your eyes opened to who Jesus is? Secondly, are you about his business in the world? If you know him as king, have you joined him in his light bringing work? Have you joined him? And by that I don't mean have you gone to Bible college and then become a pastor somewhere. I mean, where God has placed you, in your family, in your neighbourhood, in your sporting club, in your city, in your workplace, in your family, where, wherever you are, are you participating in the work of being the light bringer? Are you walking in those good works that God has prepared in advance for you to walk in so that people would see those works and not think, what a good bloke, what a lovely lady, but so that they would give glory to your Father who's in heaven. That's what we're about as a church. We're about acknowledging and worshipping our King who loves us. Our allegiance is, is, is in Him, for Him, to Him. And we as a community and as individuals, you know, as we scatter, we go being about His work in the world, being the light bringers. Let's pray together. Father, I want to thank you for your goodness and your kindness to us in Jesus. Oh, you're so good. Thank you that we don't have to pass some sort of karmic test or intelligence test or, or anything because Jesus has done the work already. Thank you that though we were blind, you've opened our eyes. Thank you that you have gifted us with faith to receive your grace. And so help us to worship you in spirit and in truth, acknowledging Jesus as he is, as our Lord, as our Saviour, as our King. Help us to have no other gods. 
Help us to not look to any other uh, loves above our love for you. And Father, help us. You've made us the light of the world. Help us to shine brightly with good works. Help us to not shy away like these parents did out of fear for being uh, booted out of their, um, their social arenas. But Father, help us to be like the formerly blind man who is nothing but an encounter with Jesus. Uh, speaks powerfully your gospel, not arrogantly, uh, in a way that, Father, for us, would see many people respond with faith. We pray this in Jesus' holy name and for His sake. Amen.